many uh, crimes are committed at the spur of the moment uh, by young people, those who later uh, come to regret their actions. If we were to talk about drug trafficking, for example, you find a lot of the uh, offenders are what we call drug mules who are employed by the big fish to go uh, to sell drugs on, on, on the streets. Now, if you were to uh, get uh, execute them, send them, uh, sentence them to death, you're not really addressing the problem of drug, drug trafficking, which is a major problem, no doubt about that. Mm. And so uh, we have to look at these uh, humanitarian as aspects as well. Good morning, you're listening to The Breakfast Grill. I'm Shazana Mokhtar. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim has made reforms the cornerstone of the government agenda. Hence, the law and institutional reform portfolio under the Prime Minister's department takes outsized importance in pursuing legislative change. One major reform currently on the table is the abolishment of the mandatory death penalty, which currently applies for 11 offences under the law. But overall, is the progress of reforms being held held back by political considerations. Joining me today to talk more about the reform agenda, including ending mandatory capital punishment, is YB Ramkarpal Singh, Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Law and Institutional Reform. He is also the Member of Parliament for Bukit Glugo. Ram, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, you have been an outspoken backbencher in Parliament during your first two terms in as MP. And uh, as they say, the third time's the charm. You're now a deputy minister in the present cabinet. You're in the driver's seat of government policy. Is it different being on the front bench? Well, certainly uh, there, there, there are differences as a backbencher. I think uh, you can uh, you, you are you have certain freedom uh, or freedoms to uh, to express yourself uh, in parliament uh, not only in parliament but also outside parliament but uh, as a as a front bencher I think uh, I think uh, you have to uh, also consider uh, government uh, the the government policy and you have to be consistent with that mm. um, so and of course concentrate on your portfolio and mine's quite mine is quite a uh, uh, there's quite a lot of things to do uh, so it's it's also a learning process for me okay uh, being a front bencher for the first time so there are definitely constraints in terms of what you can say and what you can't say and you're feeling that certainly I think uh, that is part of uh, ministerial uh, responsibility and uh, I think uh, it's uh, like I say you know it's a learning process for me as well. Mm. I want to talk about um, the current government setup and I think it caught a lot of people by surprise in a way uh, because previously uh, I think there wasn't any love lost between um, mm. DAP and UMNO, um, no love lost between um, you know Barisan National and Pakatan Harapan, you've even previously mocked the cooperation between UMNO and PAS as a marriage of convenience. Mm. How would you, um, what, how, what would you say about the present Pakatan Harapan Barisan National Alliance? Is it different from an UMNO PAS Muafakat National type of thing? Oh, I think certainly there are very clear differences uh, between that coalition and this unity government. Uh, this unity government, I think, uh, we have to make it very clear that uh, we have uh, certain uh, objectives in mind, uh, objectives which have been ap agreed upon uh, before its formation. And uh, the, the main uh, objective is, is to, uh, to sort of revive the economy, restore what has been lost over the years uh, in terms of uh, the progress of the country. And, and this requires, I think, uh, a collaboration and also uh, uh, sort of a compromise between uh, these two uh, sort of parties who have had very different ideologies in mm. the past. And so uh, with that, those uh, things in mind, those considerations in mind, um, I think uh, it, given the current political climate uh, in this country, I think it's important uh, to uh, sort of uh, look towards the future for the betterment of the country, its people, uh, and hopefully uh, we can uh, achieve uh, reforms and uh, we will see a better Malaysia in, in five years from now. 
Okay, so you're saying that、um, two sides that were previously on opposing ends, they are come together, driven by a common goal, and that is the betterment of the nation. Certainly, yes. In the past, you've、uh, you haven't pulled your punches when it comes to sparring with UMNO MPs,、mm-hmm. uh, but today you find yourself as one of the few DAP MPs that's、uh, working directly、uh, with an UMNO member. Your、mm-hmm. uh, minister is Datu Sri Azalina Othman. You're her deputy. Has it been difficult for you to shift、uh, mindset from viewing UMNO? No, as the opposition, and now as an ally. Well, I've had no issues、uh, working with Azlina. I have in the past. In fact,、uh, when even before the unity government was formed,、uh, we we worked together on the IPCMC uh, uh, select committee. She was I, she was、uh, a member of that committee as well. I, I chaired it,、mm. and so we have had a working relationship in the past. So I've I've had I I have had I have had no difficulty working with her now as well. But、uh, one thing that I did find striking was public. Reception to the pairing of you and Azalina,、um, I think there was a lot of people were quite、uh, receptive to this. There wasn't、mm. the baggage that would come with Amno、um, and DAP、uh, coming together. I mean, why do you think the public w- so readily accepted this? Does this say something about, I suppose, how you and Azalina are perceived as MPs? Well, I think、uh, I think it has to do also with our legal background. We share that in common, and uh, so uh, our ministry being obviously uh, to do with uh, the law, its、uh, reform and institutional reform. I think、uh, this has gone down well with the public.、Uh, I mean, we we at least we have、uh, some headway、uh, in this in this field. So、mm. I think perhaps that might have contributed to public perception of our. Uh, partnership.、Mm. How are responsibilities divided between you and Azalina in this portfolio? Do you work on things together, or、uh, do you focus on separate issues that、um, under this under this portfolio? Well, I mean,、uh, of course, we work together、uh, on various issues, but、uh, broadly speaking,、uh, there is an understanding that. Uh, Uh, the the our tasks are divided into two main areas. One is criminal justice reform.、Mm-hmm. Uh, the other is uh, 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 obviously uh, matters uh, more towards the civil side of things. I, I look I, I look into the criminal justice reform aspect.、Mm. Uh, she looks at the other, and、uh, of course there are many overlapping.、Uh, a lot of uh, times uh, these two、uh, broad categories will、uh, will would overlap, and so we we work together.、Uh, You know,、mm. uh, with、uh, with this in mind. Okay, let's turn to policy matters, and we're going to talk about the abolishment of the mandatory death penalty in a little bit. But I do want to get that big picture view in terms of what the government's reform priorities are. So, how would you elucidate what the reform agenda is? Well, I mean,、uh, reform is a very、uh, is a very、uh, broad sort of.、Uh, Aspect, you know, that、uh, we have to look at when we talk about reform. I think we have to keep, we have to open our minds to uh, other, uh, different points of view, views. And、uh, in in our case,、uh, reform comprises of many aspects. And、uh, the government has always、uh, kept an open mind. I think that's important to note.、Uh, we are w- very willing to、uh, listen to stakeholders, to those who have an interest. In、uh, the particular fields of reform that we are looking at, to see you know how they can contribute and give us ideas as to how how to、uh, as to the way forward, and、uh, I'm quite happy to say that、uh, you know this、uh, I've only been、uh, in this、uh, line for about three months,、mm. but in, the, in that short time,、uh, we have had、uh, occasion to have met many many、uh, stakeholders. Who have、uh, you know given us fresh ideas, and、uh, I think this is what the government wants. You know, in terms of reform, we want to hear from people. We、mm-hmm. want to know what their views are, so that we can implement them if、uh, they are found to be suitable. Okay,、yeah. so engagement is a key、um, approach in in how you tackle these reforms. I'm wondering if there's like a list of reforms that you're working towards, perhaps, because we've seen just in this past 100 days there's been movement on、um, citizenship,、mm. um, and、uh, we see other reforms coming onto the table like the mandatory、uh, death penalty abolishment. But I guess more broadly, I, do you have specific targets or or areas that、uh, you're focusing attention on? Well, 
I th- of course, uh, you know, they, uh, we have identified various areas uh, which uh, we are looking at uh, uh, to, to reform. The, uh, the death penalty is one, as you know. Um, it's coming up very soon. Uh, citizenship uh, laws have also, uh, you know, attracted considerable uh, criticism uh, of late. And I, that also uh, has been uh, looked at. Azlina, I think, has made a few announcements recently on this and we'll be looking uh, very much at uh, amending certain laws, the constitution in fact, uh, to achieve this. Other uh, aspects of reform include uh, the Freedom of Information uh, Bill or the Act that we intend to introduce, uh, Whistleblowers Act and so on. so the the list is I mean that's just a few of okay. quite quite of, of many mm. and uh, and and we are looking of course this is going to be to increase as time goes by uh, as far as prison reform is something which is very important as well mm. uh, because uh, that is something to do with uh, the criminal justice system uh, I'm looking into that personally I hope to uh, get some headway. Uh, in terms of prison reform in the near future, so it, these are all uh, these are matters which um, uh, they, 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 these problems uh, have been around for a long time, and uh, I think the time has come to at least address them hmm. and uh, find uh, solutions. Hopefully, okay. Help me understand how much autonomy you have under the law and institutional reforms portfolio to determine what reforms to pursue. Okay, I'm going to take an example, something like SOSMA amendments. Mm. Uh, This is being implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, more broadly. But um, whose call is it then um, to, I suppose, push forward these amendments? Does it come from your ministry or your agency or does it come from the Home Affairs Ministry? Well, of course, in in, in, uh, generally speaking, uh, all most uh, statutes or legislation uh, have have, uh, what we call uh, uh, carrier ministries. So in the case of SOSMA, uh, the ministry which carries that particular legislation is the Ministry of Home Affairs. Mm. So uh, any uh, initiation uh, towards reform in, in, uh, in respect of SOSMA ought to and should come from the Home Ministry. Mm-hmm. Of course, we facilitate the process by uh, assisting uh, the Home Ministry uh, in uh, partaking in engagement uh, exercises with various stakeholders and so on, mm. which uh, you know they also have a part to play in, such as uh, the uh, PDRM, um, KDN and so on. Mm. So we have to work with these uh, parties um, get their views uh, on SOSMA. I'm talking particularly about SOSMA now. Yes. So that, uh, so in other words, what what I'm saying is that we work uh, in tandem, we work together, you know, uh, when it comes to what are the areas that, what are the areas that you're, that you are, uh, that you call the shots on, if I can ask? Oh, we, we, under, under my ministry, you mean? Oh, under my ministry, we have uh, various, uh, Fields mm. which we uh, we call well, I wouldn't say we call the shots on, but we you have, have the, you're the, the carrier ministry. Yeah, suppose. of course. Uh, you know, when we talk about judicial reform, okay. uh, when, uh, when it comes to the courts, would re- Parliament also be under Parliament, your purview? Uh, these are under us. Okay. So we uh, we can uh, initiate. Um, you know, talks towards Mm. reform. I want to focus on specific reform initiatives at the moment. So let us start off with the decision to abolish the mandatory death Mm. penalty. This is something that the government is continuing from the previous administration, something that Pakatan Harapan has championed from the very beginning since 2018. It's been lauded by activists and the international community alike. But why not abolish the death penalty in totality? Why limit it to just the mandatory death penalty? Why is this arguably cruel and inhumane form of punishment being maintained in our statute books? Well, I think uh, you are absolutely right in saying that, uh, you know, the uh, abolition is something that ought to be considered, perhaps, because uh, I think uh, many countries in the world have uh, moved towards that direction. Ours is a partial abolish, uh, abolition, which is uh, just the uh, mandatory part of the death penalty. I, I think uh, the reason for that is that at this stage, perhaps uh, I think uh, we need to educate the public a bit more as to why uh, it ought perhaps uh, in the future 
uh, it might uh, it ought to perhaps be a total abolition but at this stage perhaps uh, uh, we are not uh, ready for it at this stage but mm. a start would be uh, abolishing it partially uh, the mandatory part at least so mm. When you say we're not ready for it, in what ways are we not ready for it? Is this coming from, uh, I suppose, the public or is it coming from um, political figures? Where is the pushback towards an abolition of the death penalty coming from? Well, I mean, uh, of course, there are many uh, people or parties who are pro total abolish abolition. And I, I we have heard them and I think uh, they have given us very uh, uh, good, compelling views uh, uh, and certainly, like I said, uh, it is something which uh, is not ex- has not been excluded, uh, something which we will consider uh, in the next uh, phase, uh, few uh, stages of uh, this uh, issue. Uh, but at this stage, I think uh, we, we have uh, focused on uh, the mandatory part. And uh, like you said, uh, pointed out correctly earlier, this is uh, an initiative that, w- that began in the earlier PH rule. Uh, in 2018, of course, there's been quite a few, a lot of fine tuning uh, in between uh, until now. And so I think we are now ready to uh, present uh, that uh, that bill in parliament. Uh, the government is expected to table a series of amendment bills this month, or is it just one bill? Can you walk me through, I guess, what the legal process is to abolish the mandatory death penalty across the 11 office offences yes. that it currently applies? Well, there, at this at this point of time, there are 11 offences which uh, prescribe or carry the mandatory death penalty. What that means is that the uh, in these cases, uh, a judge only has one option if he were to convict uh, an accused person, which is to sentence him to death. And so uh, in these uh, offences, uh, the uh, abolishment will mean that uh, the judge still retains the discretion mm-hmm. to uh, impose the death penalty, although he has the option of imposing uh, a jail sentence. Uh, so now at this stage, uh, what, what, uh, what we are, where we are at is that uh, we have amended uh, all, um, all the laws or statutes which prescribe the death penalty, either mandatory or not, mm-hmm. to reflect the uh, abolishment of the mandatory part of it. So we uh, we will be tabling it um, in. There'll be various readings, various stages. So it's more than one bill. Uh, yes, yes, it's more than one bill. Uh, it's each individual bills which carry those uh, sentences mm-hmm. to uh, to uh, introduce to make that change. To make that change, yes. Do you foresee any challenges to passing these amendments, and um, how soon do you think these laws can take effect? Uh, well, I don't think, uh, I mean, we are ready to uh, table them, in fact, uh, as soon as uh, this week. And the, the, there'll be de- three main stages in the day one rakyat. And I think that could uh, conclude by early April. And then there's the, uh, you have to, we have, it has to be brought to the day one Nagara, the Senate. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we have to receive the uh, royal assent, and then it so has we're to looking be at a timeline of the first half of the year, second half of the year. Oh no, I think uh, in about perhaps two months, two to three months. Okay, then we'll see those uh, that um, those amendments on the statute books, uh, and it will immediately. Then it will come into effect uh, once the it's uh, properly gazetted. Okay. Yes. I want to come to the issue of um, judicial discretion in sentencing. So mm. you said the abolishment of the mandatory death penalty will give judges the option of whether to impose a death penalty sentence or not. So there will be alternatives. Judges can exercise that. Uh, but I think if we look at amendments that were made in 2017 to the Dangerous Drugs Act, where judges were given um, that discretion for certain uh, drug trafficking offenses, it wasn't really con- consistently applied. And there seemed to be a lot of confusion Mm. with regards to uh, the interpretation of the law and uh, how it should be implemented. So I I suppose this is something that um, your ministry is cognizant of. And how are you going to uh, address these issues with these latest round of amendments that apply to so many different acts? Current amendments would completely remove the death penalty or the mandatory part of it, at least. So once that is done, it is completely in the hands of the court uh, in terms of uh, sentence, the court can uh, can it can maintain the death sentence. Uh, it has that uh, option, or it can replace it with a lesser sentence of uh, imprisonment. So it's it's in the hands of the courts. Which 
to me, just gives more power to judges then, right, to determine the fate of somebody in the dock. I suppose, how will judges be prepared uh, in to meet out that kind of sentence? You know, how will they consider uh, which option to choose in deciding uh, the fate of somebody there? Well, I think, uh, I mean, the judges are experienced, uh, you know, in especially when it comes to death penalty cases, it's only uh, reserved for the high court uh, and above. So these judges have experience in uh, meeting out sentences in these kind of cases. Of course, they would be guided by uh, past precedents um, when it comes to sentencing. Every case is unique in its own way, you know, they, they, it presents its own facts and circumstances. So the courts will have to consider uh, each case on its own uh, merits to decide whether or not uh, a lesser sentence is appropriate. So Malaysia has had a moratorium on execution since 2018. Mm -hmm. um, how soon will this moratorium be lifted once these amendments go through? And what does that mean for the 840 prisoners who are directly impacted by this, meaning that they have exhausted their appeals process and they're really just waiting for their sentence to be carried out? Well, those uh, I think there are various categories of uh, persons who are affected. One, uh, those who are whose trials are still pending or appeals are still pending, they uh, would directly uh, the the law would directly apply to them, uh, meaning that uh, if since the judicial process has not come to an end, when the new law comes into effect, it will apply retrospectively, meaning that uh, even if the offence was committed years ago, but it's still in the trial or appeal process, then the court will uh, uh, implement the new law on them. Mm -hmm. But for those whose uh, uh, appeal process have, or judicial process have come to an end, uh, there will be a, a review process where they would be, uh, they, uh, they would be at liberty to file an application back to the federal court uh, for the federal court to review their sen death sentence to to see whether or not it is an appropriate case uh, to be um, reduced. Okay. Many of the offences will carry the punishment of imprisonment for natural life in lieu of the mandatory death penalty. That's what I understand. I mean, can our already overcrowded prisons house more inmates for longer periods of time if they're sentenced to life imprisonment? I don't see how this would reduce the burden on our prison system at the moment. Uh, just yeah, before I answer the question, I think natural life is has also is also going to be uh, removed. Uh, natural life at this uh, man, quite a few offences uh, carry natural life. What that means is that a person uh, would uh, be in prison until you know he's, uh, he he passes away. Uh, that that will also be removed to to put a cap on uh, life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are discussing the uh, that particular cap. So it's no longer, it will, one of our policy decisions is to do away with natural life. Okay. Yes, so that's a, another part of uh, this uh, area of reform. I think one thing we were stuck on earlier, Ram, was about the uh, uh, removal of the sentence of imprisonment for natural life. That's mm. no longer going to be on the books uh, yes. with the mandatory abolishment. Could you talk us through what is the alternative then? What's going to replace that? Well, it'll be a prison, obviously a prison sentence uh, of, a, at a, of a certain period, uh, which there'll be a cap uh, of uh, what that period would be. And uh, this will be, of course, uh, discussed and debated in parliament uh, in the coming week or so when it's debated. Okay. Yeah, so it's no longer a, a, a case where a person uh, dies in parliament. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> dies in prison. Or slip there. I suppose parliament can be quite the chore. <laughs> yeah, it is quite challenging. But uh, yeah, so it's no longer a situation where the person dies in prison. I see. Yes, yeah, so uh, it will be. there will be a cap. Okay. Earlier you were saying something about how abolishing the mandatory death penalty will help to alleviate congestion in prisons. Can mm. you just walk me through a little bit how that's so? Because even well, though there's still a cap, there. To yeah. me, it sounds like there'll just be more people in prison. Well, I mean, uh, there are people on death row now. Uh, and that, like you noted earlier, there's a moratorium in place. So uh, they're not being executed at this point of time and they have not been for a while. So they, uh, so, uh, you know, a number of them would be, uh, I suppose, released in the event the court replaces their death sentence with a with a term of imprisonment because quite a few of them have been in prison for many years 
So uh, normally how it works is uh, the courts will deduct a certain amount or period of time from their actual uh, uh, prison sentence. And uh, so I would imagine that uh, a number of them would be uh, eligible or entitled to be released in the event uh, their sentences of death are uh, replaced with uh, imprisonment in in the coming in the near future. So that would, I suppose, ease uh, con- uh, prison congestion to a certain extent. Ram, one of the issues with the death penalty in Malaysia is the fact that it applies actually to a number of offences that are seen as not um, crimes of a huge magnitude. Yeah, mm. the fact that it applies to drug trafficking offences, it it uh, it uh, ensnares those who have uh, very small amounts of drugs in their possession. A lot of people feel that this is disproportionate punishment. Oh, will yeah. the will the abolishment of the mandatory death penalty still have uh, that kind of punishment for these crimes? Of course, uh, you know, like I completely agree with what you just said. I think every sentence, the prim- principle of proportionality, must be uh, at the forefront when it comes to sentencing. So at this point of time, a person can be presumed to be a drug trafficker, you know, if he uh, has uh, more than 15 grams of heroin on his in, possess- in his possession compared to someone who has, say, 500 grams. They both same uh, face the same fate. So that's obviously not proportionate. So when we introduce this new law, the court can uh, take into account uh, that fact, uh, the amount of drugs and so on in considering whether or not he should face the death penalty compared to someone who has a uh, you know, larger amount of drugs on him, is, as an example. But uh, as far as uh, uh, sentencing is concerned, I think another very important uh, f- factor is uh, the rehabilitative part of uh, prisoners. I think it's very important to consider because uh, as all sentencing... Uh, exercises uh, would take into account rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when we sentence somebody, we should also bear in mind, uh, you know, his rehabilitative process. Of course, if you were to execute someone, the question of his rehabilitation and entering into society again in the future doesn't arise. Right. Right. So uh, this this was also a very uh, important factor and consideration taken into account. Okay. You know, the idea of rehabilitative justice sounds great in theory, Mm. but what are the challenges in transitioning from a punitive to a rehabilitative approach? Because I feel like the urge for um, punishment is a lot stronger than the urge to rehabilitate sometimes. Well, I think, you know, there's so many uh, things to look at, you know, uh, uh, many... uh, Crimes are committed at the spur of the moment uh, by young people, those who later uh, come to regret their actions in the in the long term. Uh, so you know when we look at the, the statistics and look into uh, their uh, why these offences are committed, if we were to talk about drug trafficking, for example, you find a lot of the uh, offenders are what we call drug mules. Uh, you know, those are what we call the little fish, you know, uh, who are employed by the big fish to go uh, to sell drugs on, on, on the streets. Now, if you were to uh, get, uh, execute them, send them, uh, sentence them to death, you're not really addressing the problem of drug, drug trafficking, which is a major problem, no doubt about that. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I think when we talk about... Uh, uh, coming to to of rehabilitation, we have to look at these uh, humanitarian as- aspects as well. Okay, I think we cannot lose sight of uh, these, uh, these these realities. Okay, so it's a real, but it's going to be a big shift, right? It's supposed to, it should be across all society in terms of the sis- those working in the system as well as the public outside of it. I I, I think so. Yes. Okay, we don't have much time left on the clock, Ram, but I do want to just maybe get some updates on other uh, reforms on the table, like what you're currently working on. Um, Let's do a rapid fire round. I'll ask you about a particular legislative reform that you've spoken about in the past, and maybe you can give us a quick status update. Uh, SOSMA amendments, Mm. I want to start there. Uh, What's the progress of stakeholder engagement? We have already started the process. We have met with various stakeholders. Uh, We've met with PDRM. We've met with various NGOs, lawyers. Uh, who are practicing in this field. Uh, so, of course, we've got many uh, more uh, engagement rounds to go. Uh, we hope to complete them in the near future within the next uh, few months. 
and uh, come up with uh, recommendations as to how this law can be, uh, you know, improved perhaps. Does it personally pain you, Ram, given that you've spoken up against Swasma in the past? Mm. Uh, you've spoken for it to be uh, abolished or amended, uh, but that that's not happening at the pace that was initially uh, desired. Yes. I mean, is that something that causes pain for you? Well, uh, I don't think it causes pain, but uh, it can be a, a bit of a disappointment. But because I, I was in practice before um, as a criminal lawyer mainly, and I used to do uh, quite a number of SOSMA related cases. So I, I have seen uh, how it can be, uh, you know, uh, how, how there, there are weaknesses in SOSMA which need to be uh, improved or addressed at, le addressed at least. So uh, I, th I think it's important to discuss this with all those, even those who are pro SOSMA, to perhaps uh, get their points of view, perhaps, you know, give our points of view to them so that we can find solutions. Because I believe SOSMA uh, requires or needs to be addressed and solutions needs needs to need to be found. Okay. What about uh, efforts to decriminalize suicide? Uh, how is that? How, what's the progress on that? Are we moving along on this? Because this is also something that you've spoken about. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, now, and currently, uh, attempted suicide is, a, is an offence. Uh, and uh, we are looking towards uh, decriminalizing that offense. In other words, make, uh, taking it away, uh, uh, doing away with that uh, offense. I think uh, when we talk about uh, attempted suicide, uh, there's a lot of uh, things to consider, it's particularly you know, the mental health of, uh, of a person who attempts suicide. And so it's very, uh, it's not uh, only uh, uh, confined to, uh, or to it being a criminal issue. I think it's also very much a medical issue, uh, which uh, requires, uh, and we have engaged with the health ministry and so on, mm -hmm. on this to see how best we can improve various uh, statutes and legislation such as the Mental Health Act to uh, accommodate uh, those who are, you know, depressed and so on, who consider taking their lives, mm. and so uh, certainly uh, we we are we will be abolishing the crime of uh, attempted suicide. Okay, so that's something in the future to look at. Uh, you've spoken in the past about abolishing the Sedition Act, albeit in a previous role <laughs> as the backbencher. Uh, is this at all on the cards? Uh, not at this point of time, but uh, it's something that perhaps uh, we, we, we will, it's not, we have not excluded that possibility, but something perhaps further down in the pipeline. Okay, and how soon can we see a Freedom of Information Bill being tabled? I think uh, 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 perhaps by towards the end of this year. Okay, all right, so yeah. there's a timeline in that sense. We can see, uh, we may see something on the cards by the end of the year. Uh, Ram, in the little bit of time that we have, um, the country is scheduled to go to uh, state elections in six states uh, later in the, in the year, in June. Yeah. What I want to ask is, are state elections um, a reason for putting the brakes on reform progress at the moment? So we have received, uh, I guess, viewpoints from observers that say uh, the government is not moving fast enough on reforms because of political considerations due to state elections. Mm. How much will the state elections impact what the reform agenda of the government is? No, I think uh, state elections is, uh, of course, it's you, it's inevitable. It's uh, coming to, to yeah, as you said, around June, July. Uh, but I think uh, reform should not be halted because of the state elections. Uh, certainly, uh, what we are we are looking to implement. In fact, uh, reforms can uh, sort of uh, be good for state elections in the sense that people might uh, be happy that uh, there are progressive, uh, you know, initiatives taken by this current government, and it could augur well for them in in the state elections as well. Ram, there's never enough time to cover everything yeah. that we want, but thank you so much for yeah. uh, coming to studio and taking time to speak to us today. Thank you. I've been speaking to YB Ram Karpal Singh, Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department and MP for Bukit Galugor. This has been The Breakfast Grill on BFM 89.9.